So now we're going to move on to the Denur Nassim database reconstruction setting and the attack. So, okay, let's, let's talk about the setup first, what type of setting we're working in. I'll comment before we go any further that much of this presentation is based off of section 8.1 of uh, the book by uh, Dwork and Roth. So let's, let's uh, work with a rather simplified model just to sort of expose the bare interesting case which uh, we can really study and talk about and discuss attacks, an interesting phenomenon. So imagine we have a database with uh, several points, which we refer to as rows. So a row is kind of one point. Uh, we'll just use these synonymously. And similarly, a uh, column is going to be uh, used to refer to a dimension or a feature. So some of these features will be identifiers, which for the sake of uh, today, we'll be assuming are public data, uh, just some, something similar, like, sim simple, like, you know, we have someone's name, this is an identifier, postal code, their, say, date of birth or sex. These are all, say, identifiers and are publicly known, let's say. And then there will also be uh, one feature or one column, which is the secret. And uh, the secret will be a bit that is either uh, zero or one. This is, of course, what the uh, individual wants to be, uh, wants to keep private. Uh, so somehow, in some sense, we shouldn't disclose what the secret bit is. And we're going to let D, which is going to be one bit for each person, so it'll be 0, 1 to the n, it'll just have one bit for each person, be the vector of secret bits. That's the kind of setup of uh, what a database is going to be in this setting. And uh, you, can, you can see here, uh, for example, these four columns here, name, postal code, date of birth, and sex, those are going to be the identifiers, which, um, you know, maybe we know Alice's postal code, date of birth or whatever. These are not a big deal for the sake of this uh, setting, but uh, whether or not they have the disease is going to be uh, their secret, so to speak. So hopefully this is clear that each individual has a secret bit, which they don't want to be released, even when, uh, you know, there's, there's some queries released about this data set. Okay, so that's that's the type of setting in terms of what we'll have. Uh, let's let's be a bit more precise in terms of uh, what the setup here is, in terms of uh, who the participants in this type of attack will be, uh, what they have the power to do, and what counts as a valid attack or not. So there will be two parties here. There will be the analyst and the curator. The data analyst is trying to answer questions, trying to trying to get answers to the questions. So they, they're curious about things in the database and the curator will respond, but uh, try to preserve uh, privacy. So they'll respond, but somehow privately, meaning they'll try to give answers, but not uh, answers from which the analyst could learn exactly what these bits are. So let's, let's be a bit more precise. They're trying to get answers and they'll ask questions of the following form. They'll ask how many rows satisfy conditions. How many of these have has disease equal one? So this is the type of uh, question that uh, they'll ask. And what, what does conditions mean? Conditions mean that, uh, that there's a way of specifying certain rows from the data set. For example, one example is, uh, one, one example of uh, what conditions can be would be name equals Alice, or name equals Bob, or name equals Eve. 
So in this case, uh, just sort of substituting this in, let's see what the answer is. How many rows satisfying uh, name equals one of these three things has has disease equal one? Uh, well, we can see that first row, second row, and fifth row, two of them do. So the answer, so the true answer is, true answer is uh, two. More, we're going to take a little bit of an abstraction. What, what we could see is that essentially in this instance, by specifying the names and putting ors between them, then the uh, analyst could select any subset, any, uh, any subset of the domain and uh, find the sum of their bits, basically how many uh, people have has disease equal one. So we're going to work in a slightly uh, more abstract form where, you know, queries the queries are uh, set S, which is a subset of uh, the uh, sort of number of individuals, N. And uh, we're, we're going to specify it in the following way. In, in fact, uh, it's going to be a subset of N. And we're going to let S be uh, a vector, in particular 0, 1 to the N, where Sorry, there's a bit poor notation just because I've used it, but uh, just picture S as being sort of an indicator vector where it says which ones are in the set uh, and which ones aren't. So S i equals one if i is in the subset. And uh, equals zero else. So that's how we're going to specify uh, subsets, uh, how we're going to specify queries. And in particular for this one, the, uh, the specific query we did here, then our uh, vector S for the query would be something like, uh, because it picks the first, second, and fifth one, it would be one, zero, sorry, actually one, one, zero, zero, one. So that is the uh, subset which it will query. So we're going to use the term for these types of queries, naturally subset queries. Now, one thing I'll note is the fact that these might actually be quite complex to specify. Note that, you know, we kind of had this or statement for each individual in this, uh, that we want to include in our set. You know, if you want to include all of them or something, you would have to say Alice or Bob or Charlie or David or Eve. The point is that I'm trying to get it here is that specifying these subsets, we, we going from this type of thing to specifying the set S, there's a little bit of a, a translation needed here. And it might be quite a complex translation in the sense that they might have to ask very, very long queries. But we're not going to worry about this too much. Uh, don't worry about complexity for now. And we'll revisit this a bit when we talk about the practical attack uh, by Cohen and uh, Nassim. So yeah, we're just going to work in the abstraction that they can specify a set S like this. And the last thing we need to say about the analyst before we move on to what the curator does is the following. The value of a query, so if they give a set S, which is going to be the following form, uh, this is going to be the true answer. Let me just write true answer uh, is going to have uh, A of S. And this is going to be equal to the inner product of the database and the query set S. So in particular, let's just do this example we had here. Uh, when you take one, one, zero, zero, one, and you take the inner product with the true database, which is one, zero, one, zero, one. Well, when you do this and take the dot product, you can see it matches on the first bit uh, and the last bit, so this equals two which is, like we said, the true answer is two. Okay, so that's what the analyst uh, can do. They can specify subsets, uh, and they're trying to, with, which have certain true answers, and they're trying to answer these types of queries, or get answers to these types of queries. Now, like I said, uh, what, what does the curator do? The curator is trying to respond, but somehow uh, answering these questions privately. So what, what does the curator do? So the curator will receive a query, uh, they get a set S, and they'll return, uh, they'll respond with R of S. Now, 
let's observe the fact that suppose they just want to answer the query. What they could do is they just, one option is uh, just setting RFS to be equal to AFS. Essentially just give the analyst the correct answer and uh, that, that's all you have to do. And this will be great for the analyst. The analyst would love that uh, because they can just get exact answers to all their queries. But this is not great for privacy. Say like S equals uh, just, the, just the string which takes a one in the first place and zero everywhere else. Well, if, uh, if the analyst asked this query, then what the uh, curator would respond with is the private bit of the first individual, which would of course grossly violate their privacy. So that's not uh, what we want. Uh, so no, not this. On the other hand, what they, what they, what instead they'll do is uh, add noise. And what do I mean by that? Uh, they'll do it in the following way. They'll return or output any sort of uh, R of S such that uh, it's close enough to, it's close enough to AFS. So in particular, say RFS is their true ans is their answer and AFS is the true answer. We'll say they have to return something which is within distance E of the uh, true answer. Okay, so one last comment I wanna make before we move on is the fact that, you know, we, call, we say like, I, I said it like they're adding noise, but this is not ne necessarily random noise that they have to add here. This is just arbitrary or adversarial noise. They can choose to modify AFS however they want to uh, before um, returning RFS. So this kind of gives the curator a lot of power. All they have to do is be constrained to the fact that their answers are sort of sufficiently close to uh, the true answers within distance E. And we want to add a non-zero noise just because of the fact that uh, otherwise you can do things like this. Or also, even if you use suppression tactics, uh, recall that in the previous example with the census, we saw that uh, by not adding noise, it was possible to generate these constraints and come up with a solution that is feasible. Okay, so hopefully this is clear. There's an analyst who's trying to get answers to questions and a curator who's trying to respond, but privately. And let's now finally get to the definition of what it means for an algorithm to be, or what, what, uh, what a set of responses or a protocol to be blatantly non-private. And we have this definition here. We say that an algorithm is blatantly non-private if an adversary can construct a database C uh, in zero one to the N such that it matches the true database D in all but little O of N entries. So recall, I'm just going to remind you that, you know, D is in uh, zero one to the N. And so like the, the idea is if they can make a new database C, which matches D on almost everything, say like 99.9% .9 of entries, then we call that blatantly non-private. And indeed, this is like a pretty flagrant violation of privacy. Imagine, you know, an adversary was able to reconstruct the entire database of private bits. That would, of course, be a blatant privacy violation. Here, we just say that, you know, maybe they don't do 100%, but maybe they do 99.9% .9 of uh, the database. Uh, we consider that to be a blatant privacy violation as well. Okay, so this is a rather, uh, a rather uh, weak... Uh, you know, it's a strong attack in the sense it can get a lot, but uh, it turns out that this type of thing uh, is actually fairly common in the sense that, you know, the sort of claim that will uh, justify throughout the next, uh, the rest of this part is that fairly general schemes are blatantly non-private. All right, so yeah, uh, let's let's talk about how exactly this is done. We're going to present two attacks for in this uh, in today's class. We're going to say that first of all, uh, you know, what if we don't care about efficiency? What if the uh, analyst is allowed to ask a lot of queries and we don't care about computation time? 
Can they uh, say that something is blatantly non-private? And after that, we're going to be a little bit more concerned with uh, the number of queries they can ask, how many questions they can ask, uh, and the running time allowed, and show that it's still attackable in pretty similar settings. So okay, first of all, let's talk about uh, the inefficient attack of Dinur and Nassim, and uh, we'll discuss it and prove it. This one is quite a bit easier than the efficient attack, but it says the following. Suppose the analyst were allowed to ask two to the n subset queries. Like I said, it's going to be inefficient, but that's okay for now. And suppose the curator adds noise with some bound e. So recall, as we did before, their responses r of s will be mandated to be within e of uh, a of s. So if those are the rules, then based on the results that the analyst gets back, the uh, adversary or the analyst can reconstruct the database in all but four times e positions. So let's interpret that a bit. So let's let's sort of say a corollary or two. So if e equals n over say 401, then uh, you know you can reconstruct in 99% of the entries. That's a pretty blatant uh, and big attack. Uh, and if you take the e to be anything like sort of asymptotically smaller than that set, setting e to be a uh, little o of n, then you get blatant non-privacy. OK, so this seems like a very, very powerful attack. Let's see how exactly we do it. What, what exactly is the attack? It's a very simple attack to uh, state. You might have guessed the fact that you know we do two to the n subset queries. Well, there's only two to the n possible subsets. So the uh, the setup, the, the way we do this attack is kind of the following. Uh, we'll first say the attack, and then we'll say how we analyze it to prove that it's true. So this is the following. Um, the analyst asks all two to the uh, n subset queries. And how do we do this? Well, let's just say, you know, just to illustrate what I mean, first of all, you could have uh, the first question they would ask is just about the first individual, and then about, uh, say, only the second individual, and then about uh, the first and second individual. I'm basically doing binary counting here, and so on. And the point is that, uh, you know, you ask all two to the n possible queries of this form. OK, so that's the first step of the attack, like step one. Now, step two will be uh, the following. You loop through all the possible candidate databases, like for all c in 0, 1 to the n what you're going to do is the following. Uh, see if there exists a, a query set S such that you have the following uh, inequality. Summation of CI minus R of S is greater than E. If so, then if so, rule out S, or sorry, rule out C. And then the final step is, uh, you know, output any C which is not ruled out. So like, what, what am I saying? I'm saying, let, let me just try to state this in words. I wrote it a bit more formally here, but it's really just the following. Ask every single subset query that you possibly can, and then find which of the databases was actually possible, which of these uh, you know, candidate databases C was actually possible given the constraints we know about the adversary. Uh, the claim is if you output anything which is actually feasible based on the constraints placed on the adversary, or sorry, that were placed on the curator, then uh, 
uh, this will have the guarantee that it uh, matches in all but four E positions. Okay, so that's the whole algorithm. Uh, ask all the queries, find anything consistent with those queries. Let's try to analyze this. Uh, the first thing we note is that, uh, in particular, uh, the true database, D, wouldn't be ruled out. Uh, and so, you know, this algorithm will uh, halt in the sense that, uh, or it will output something because for sure it'll output at least uh, D, but it might output something else. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to prove this by uh, essentially showing that, uh, you know, anything that it is output, anything that agrees on uh, all these constraints will have at most four times E total error in terms of uh, the number of indices that it matches on. And how are we going to do this? We're going to define a few different sets. We're going to let i not be the set of all uh, indices, the set of all i, where di equals zero. So what does this mean? This means like which uh, coordinates uh, in the, the, num the coordinates in which the true database is equal to zero. And similarly, we're going to define i sub one to be you know the same thing i such that d sub i equals one. Okay, so those are two important sets we'll have to focus on. So let's let's consider any uh, c which is output. Suppose uh, c is output. What that means in particular is that it was not ruled out at any point. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means the following. We can say that this is true. So what is this? Uh, I'm saying that recall that the adversary uh, that the adversary is trying to use a strategy that uh, that they will output anything that hasn't been ruled out. So. A thing is ruled out if it finds a set where uh, there's the distance is greater than e. So in particular, for all sets, uh, we have that the bound is less than or equal to e. And therefore, in particular, on the set where uh, we're looking at i not, the set of uh, indices in which the true database is equal to zero, we have this bound, which is true. Simultaneously, we want to ask uh, what the value of r of i not was given, what that was given uh, by the cur by the curator. Well, what do we know? We know that the uh, curator is restricted to adding noise, which is bounded by uh, bounded by e. So, in particular, this will give us something which is bounded above by e. So the convenient thing here is essentially by putting these two inequalities together, we want to find out how close uh, C, the ci vector and the di vector are here. Well, putting these together, it tells us that essentially using a triangle inequality that uh, C and D differ by at most uh, two E indices. Uh, two E indices in uh, the set I naught. Uh, that's rather, that's a nice thing to know. This is for one set i naught, And then also just essentially doing the exact same proof, you can say that the same thing that they differ by less than or equal to two e uh, differences in i1. So it differs by most uh, two e indices in i naught and two e uh, differences also in i one. Well, note that i naught and i one partition the entire uh, 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 set of indices one through n because a bit is either zero or one. So therefore, uh, overall, it says that there's less than or equal to four e in differences overall. 
And this is exactly what we were trying to prove. You know, this is, we were trying to say that they can reconstruct the database in all but 40 positions. And that's exactly what we showed that if they follow the strategy, uh, there will be less than 40 differences overall. Okay, let's uh, state this uh, result a little bit more succinctly once again. And the way of saying it is that if the analyst is allowed to ask two n questions with noise bounded by O of n, then the adversary can reconstruct essentially the entire database. This arrives at the very strong conclusion of blatant non-privacy. However, the downside was that it required the analyst to be able to ask exponentially many queries, which is not a very realistic condition in the sense, you know, if there's n individuals in the database, uh, if n is say 100 or more than that, you'll never be able to ask two to the 100 uh, queries in order to execute this type of attack. But it was really just a warm up and to show how things uh, worked. Uh, it's possible to execute a stronger attack. In particular, uh, Denur and Nassim also provide a stronger attack, uh, which is an efficient attack. So let's take a look at this efficient attack. We're not going to prove it uh, today, but let's at least, uh, I'll, we'll describe what the attack is and then at least sketch the analysis of it. And uh, yeah, it'll be important in terms of seeing how it compares with the previous type of attack and where uh, it breaks down. So the attack is the following. Suppose the analyst is allowed to ask uh, O of n subset queries, and the curator adds noise with some bound uh, E, which is on the order of, say, uh, square root n. Then based on the results, there exists a computationally efficient adversary who can reconstruct the database in, uh, in all but O of alpha squared positions. So let's, let's just say that you know, essentially, let, let's compare this with before. Before we said uh, two to the n queries. With O of n noise will lead to blatant non privacy. Here we have say O of n queries. But only O of uh, square root n noise. So we can see that, you know, we're adding less noise this time, but it's nonetheless uh, possible to sort of break this, uh, to attack this with far, far fewer queries. We don't need two to the end, we only need order n queries. So this seems like a much better attack, uh, despite the fact that, uh, you know, it can't handle as much noise, but, you know, it's now efficient in queries and in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the, Time, running time as well. Okay, so let me describe the attack sort of uh, briefly, not in full detail, but at least the same the idea, which is really the same idea as before. So the attack is the following: uh, the uh, the analyst will ask essentially random queries. What do I mean by that? So each uh, subset is going to be a uniformly random subset of uh, 0, 1 to the n. So, you know, s. You, you basically choose a point uniformly at random from the Boolean hypercube. So let, let me just say, yeah. Uh, s is chosen. uniformly at random from 0, 1 to the n. So you do this uh, how many times? You do this O of n times. And then the second step is really, again, the same as before. After you got your queries, you find any database, uh, any database C, which is consistent. And this is done in a very similar way to before. Um, let me comment one thing. Uh, before, uh, we just did this sort of second step by enumerating over all possible databases, but it's possible to do this more efficiently using a linear program. And linear programming uh, with some appropriate rounding will be a polynomial time algorithm here. So this will be an efficient attack, both in terms of the number of queries and as well as the running time. 
So like I said, we're not going to uh, prove this result here, but we'll at least give some intuition as to why this is true. The intuition itself is still a bit like tricky, uh, so it might be challenging, but uh, hopefully you can follow the sort of major steps here. So let's first of all change the domain. We're going to instead, uh, before we were working in uh, 0, 1 to the n, we're going to move now to all the bits, all, all the things being in plus minus 1 to the n. So c, d, and s. Uh, so the database as well as the query sets will all be specified in terms of minus 1, uh, plus 1 to the n. So essentially we're saying that the zeros become minus 1 just for some sort of symmetry and balance. Okay, and let's suppose suppose C and D uh, differ in a lot of uh, in a lot of different coordinates. And by that I mean so D is a true database. C will just be some fixed database, which is sort of a candidate. We're going to show the following claim. The claim is that if you, uh, if you took the, a, a query, a random query, and you applied it to both uh, the database C and the database D, then the claim is if, uh, because they're very far apart and this query is randomly chosen, then the query applied to both these different databases will result in very different results. In fact, these will be very, very different results, such a big uh, different in, difference in the results, such that the, uh, uh, the curator who's able to shift these by uh, a budget of roughly square root n in terms of their noise, they'll una be unable to make these uh, two uh, databases consistent. So it'll be unable to sort of fool an analyst into thinking that uh, it was only, uh, that it could be either of them, and it'll sort of rule one of them out based on this. So this will just give you, so sort of one uh, random query will sort of uh, demonstrate that a single one is no good. But if we sort of apply the same type of reasoning to, uh, by applying many, many uh, queries, basically omega of, or on the order of n queries, then this will make sure that each individual database, uh, which is sort of far from the truth, will be ruled out with very high probability. And then taking a union bound over all the different uh, possibilities of C, will say that, uh, that uh, essentially only the ones which were actually close to D to begin with will, be, uh, will survive. So this was kind of high level. Let's, uh, let's take it a little bit slower. So let's consider the following inner product, C minus D dot S. And let's write this out. We can write it as the following. So this is the random queries we're going to do. And the uh, S is a random query. And the idea is looking at uh, C dot S minus D dot S. That looks at how much the difference between these two queries would be, uh, this query would be under these two databases, which differ in omega of n coordinates. So essentially what we're going to want to show here is that this is going to be a very large value uh, and that uh, the two databases, yeah, would have different uh, results under the same query. Now, how do we do this? So first of all, we'll reason about uh, C i, uh, you know, if C i equals D i in the sense that they don't uh, differ on that coordinate, then uh, this coordinate will be equal to zero. Uh, C i minus D i times, times S i will equal zero. And that should be clear just because this term will be equal to zero. Otherwise, if they differ, then the claim is that uh, ci minus di times si will be equal to uh, plus 2 with probability 1 half and minus 2 with probability 1 half. And why is that? Well, it's because of the following fact. If they have, if they differ, you know, one is plus one, one is minus one, 
then this term here, ci minus di, will either be plus two or minus two. And then since uh, si is going to be uniformly random plus or minus one, then that'll either keep the sign the same or flip it uniformly at random. So you can see this in the end. Therefore, uh, what do we want? What can we say now about this overall sum here? Then we can say that c uh, the summation of ci minus di times si will be a random variable, which is distributed roughly as a binomial omega of n comma one half. So let's let's try to see why and why this is. Uh, I claim that there's some sort of a rescaling and also uh, shifting here. But essentially, why is this? I'm just saying that uh, there's a rescaling here due to the fact that this is plus or minus two rather than plus or minus one. There's a shifting because this will be centered around uh, you know the number of coordinates they differ uh, divided by two because that's the expected value. But uh, essentially, it'll have the same type of distribution as this uh, up to some rescaling and shifting. And this omega of n, I'll just comment that that's the same one that we had here. Uh, they differ. We only count uh, the terms in which they differ. Uh, OK, so once we have this in hand, then we can start to analyze what this sum roughly looks like. In particular, we have that c minus d dot product with s uh, has a few properties. First of all, the mean is going to be equal to uh, 0. This is easy to see just because uh, of the fact that this is plus or minus two with equal probability. Note that this binomial wouldn't have mean zero, but like I said, it's rescaled. The main purpose that uh, we wanted to use here is the fact that uh, the variance of this uh, binomial is going to be omega of n. So yeah, this, this, can, this is not hard to see just by uh, properties of the binomial distribution. Uh, yeah, and it has variance, which is at least omega of n based on the fact that they differ in n coordinates. So, okay, this is, this is basically all we need to know. It has mean zero and variance omega of n. What does this uh, variance bound mean? The variance is kind of large, which implies that uh, c minus d times s uh, in terms of the absolute value will be greater than or equal to omega of square root n with good probability, like with, say, large probability. I don't want to say high probability. Maybe it could be a constant or something. Um, but yeah, why is this? Because it's a distribution with mean 0 and variance, which is sufficiently large. So by a type of anti-concentration result, uh, this is different from concentration results that uh, we use often. But by anti-concentration, we can say that uh, this is going to be far from its expected value of 0. So what have we showed here? We've shown that uh, sort of the difference that these two databases take on uh, the true query s will be large. Now remember, the curator, let's, let's take a check in on the curator, they sort of said that we, we sort of restricted them to saying that the e is bounded above by, like, say, little o of square root n. So what does that mean? If this is the difference that the two databases uh, take on this query, it's omega of n, and the curator is only allowed to fudge these values, that is, change the value of the true answer by little o of n, so putting this and this together, essentially says that the curator won't be able to fool uh, uh, won't be able to fool the analyst into thinking that C was a valid database for the query. So putting these together, the analyst can rule out C. The reason being because they'll get answers which are somewhat similar to D uh, inner product of S. And even after this uh, modification, it won't be the case that C is plausible. 
So, okay, this tells us uh, this was just a single fixed, uh, fixed candidate. So we ruled out just but one possible database. However, there's a lot of possible databases, right? There's two to the n possible databases. How do we rule out others? Well, this is where I said uh, this was just one query, right? This was just analyzing a single random uh, query s. So the sort of proof is concluded by saying the following. Uh, there's for, sort of two to three steps to conclude this. So if we take omega of n queries, then you'll rule out uh, any C, any fixed candidate C with high probability, like with very, very high probability if you take N uh, queries. And then you just take a union bound over all queries, which uh, are over all possible C, which are uh, differ by at least uh, omega n coordinates. So what does that say? If we union bound over all C which are far from D, then this tells us that uh, the only possible ones which are not ruled out are the ones which are close to uh, C, or uh, close to D. Uh, And so that's essentially how the proof goes. This is just like a high level picture. Uh, the key sort of step here is the fact that a random query will distinguish between two possible databases due to anti-concentration. Uh, and you just do a bunch of queries in order to rule out, uh, to rule out all the ones which are far. So that's the sketch of the proof. I recommend seeing the proof of theorem 8.2 in uh, the book by Dwork and Roth. Okay, so let's uh, recap what we saw so far. Uh, we're basically done with going over the theoretical part of uh, the Denord Nassim attack. So there was attack one. Uh, attack one, like I said, has uh, two to the n queries and uh, how much O of n noise. Attack uh, two had O of n queries and O of uh, square root n noise. So this one seems, in my mind, a lot stronger to me, especially since o, o of n noise is pretty ridiculous. You would never really add this much uh, noise to queries if you wanted to get meaningful answers. It would totally obliterate whatever your signal is. But uh, yeah, so this is perhaps a more reasonable attack. This is actually possible to strengthen a bit. Uh, there's another paper by Dwork, uh, McSherry, and Talwar. McSherry and Talwar from, I think, 07. And this one says uh, that even if some of the queries may be uh, totally wrong, for example, this says that the, the current attack that I presented, uh, the curator is restricted to saying that all the queries have uh, noise less than say, square root of n. But uh, this attack allows, say, 20% of the queries to just be totally arbitrarily uh, noisy, in the sense you can add uh, maybe to 20% of the queries uh, noise on the order of omega n. So the question is, even when you have these queries which might totally throw you off in some sense, is it still possible to uh, execute this attack? And the answer is yes, um, in certain... It, up to some certain bound. So okay, these are these are the two main attacks that we have though. And I'll claim that this latter attack is tight in some way by differential privacy. Um, and we'll we'll talk more about what I mean by this precisely in the next lecture. But uh, one way of saying it is that differential privacy would allow us to add a uh, square root n uh, magnitude noise and still answer uh, O of n queries on this uh, data set of this type. So uh, it kind of goes very sharply from being able to actually answer these queries via 
uh, differential privacy to there being an attack which is effective. So it just goes very quickly between those two. Um, but yeah, we'll see more about that uh, in later lectures. Uh, I'll comment that this upper bound will also scale down uh, in the sense that this had O of n queries and O of root n noise, but you can also say answer O of m uh, queries uh, with O of square root m noise. Uh, so this is, this is kind of safe in the sense that there's no attack here using differential privacy as well for any m m which is sort of less than n. So for example, if you only wanted to ask like say 100 uh, queries on a database which is very, very large, then it turns out differential privacy will allow you to uh, do that with much less noise than uh, sort of naively just adding uh, something based on the size of the database. Okay, so that's uh, the de Neuron Decim attacks in theory. In the next segment, we're going to move on to seeing database reconstruction in practice.